Hello, my name is Danny Nolan and I'm the Director of Chassis Sim Technologies. In this latest uh, Chassis Sim video tutorial today, what I want to do is to give you guys some tips and tricks about creating circuit models to use for Chassis Sim. Now, I realize that I've spent a couple of videos where I've discussed this topic, but what I'm aiming to do in this tutorial is to sort of tie some of those earlier tutorials I've done together. And in particular, I want to sort of give you a little bit more of a practical hands-on approach about you know, what to do, the order in which you should do things in, and what to look for when you start looking at um, your overlaid data and what to look for. So let's get started. First things first, before you get started, one thing I would really, really strongly recommend, particularly if you're a chassis sim novice, is that you get really deliberate about where you, about your directory structures. And the reason you need to be deliberate about your directory structures is it just gives you a structure to fall back on. Now, obviously, once you're a little bit, a little bit further down the road, you can sort of mix it up a little bit. But to start with, the directory structure I would suggest is what I've illustrated here. So what I've got is I've set up a folder in Chassis Sim Technologies. I'm going to call it Model. Then I call it car name, then I'll call it circuit. And depending on what I'm doing, um, I might even take that even down a level further where I will call this a test one, race one, etc., etc. Now, in this folder, you will see what I've got is I've got my car file and I've got my monster file. Now, as we all know, as we've discussed in some other tutorials, the chassis sim monster file is that link between your data and what the, is the link between your data and the car model. It's really, really, really important to get the, uh, it's really, really important to get this right. Let me just sort of give you a quick recap of what should be in um, the monster file. So in the monster file, we've got um, distance in meters, RPM, lateral acceleration in G, longitudinal acceleration in G, front left dampers, or front left damper, front right damper, rear left damper, rear right damper, that's all in millimeters, and it's all in millimeters. It is positive in bump, and I would also strongly recommend zero at the ground. Steered, in terms of steered, uh, steering input at um, the tire, throttle and speed in kilometers per hour. That's the format you're looking for for the monster file. Now, the reason that we put this all in the same directory is when we go off and start running our tire force modeling and when we start generating bump profiles, it all will be put into this directory. It's also a really good convention to use in terms of just organizing things, but um, but um, but obviously once you've got a refined circuit model, you can put that circuit model wherever you uh, wherever you like. And in particular, we've discussed a tool called the master circuit file, where you can just put it all into one um, circuit file. So, without further ado, let's get started. Now, due to the fact that chassis chassis sim is fully transient software, there are two critical elements to your circuit models in chassis sim. The first is a curvature file. So let's go through and create that. So that's going to be the first thing we do. So to create a curvature file, we get a circuit. We go to create filter curvature file. I'll click on my real curvature file, which is my monster file. I'll click here if using the monster file, and I make sure I put in my frequency of the raw cur of the raw curvature file or monster file, which is in this case 50 hertz. I'm going to kick off by using a moving average filter. The reason I'm using a moving average filter is it's pretty robust in terms of um, what you're going to uh, be doing. So I'd probably recommend if you're starting out, use the moving average filter, set the time for filter to 0.5 a second, click on output curvature file, and now I'm going to call this track Zanvort. And I'm going to click on open. And we're done. And when we're done, we just click on OK. That's it, you've just generated the curvature file. To double check what that did, I always like to go to edit variable grip factors, import the curvature file, there you go. So that gives you a quick graphic just to make sure that you've got something that looks like the actual circuit. Now, the next step in this process is that we create a bump profile. Now, I've taken the liberty of loading a car file specific to um, the setup sheet that you saw in my in this uh, folder here and let me just open that up very briefly that was my particular setup and what i've done is i've entered my car file appropriately to that setup so once you've got that the next step in the process is we create our bump profile now what i'll do is i click here to add my monster import file 
I'll click on create bump profile. Now, let me just walk you through a few uh, a few settings that you need to be aware of. First of all, you put in your damper sampling period. That's set to a full, default of 0.02 of a second or 50 hertz, which is what, you, what your monster shot file should be at. So I would leave that as is. Maximum bump rate, that's going to depend on the sort of car you've got. This is an open wheeler, so I tend to use the max, maximum bump rate at about 0.2 of a meter per second. If you're dealing with something like a, a touring car, whether it's say a British tour, a VA supercar, NASCAR type of vehicle, you'd probably go 0 0.3, 0 0.4. So there's some good rules of thumb to get going. GT cars are between about 0.2 and 0.3. Now, the other key thing is make sure you put in your zero flag that you've zeroed. If you've got this damper zeroed on the deck, make sure you put in one. Now, the other thing that I'd also recommend is click along Allow Auto Bump Scaling. And I used to like, and I like to use an average of about two or three runs. It just, what this allows is it allows Shaxxas to really drill down in terms of what the bumps are doing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to click OK to kick that off. And what's going to happen is this now starts the bump profiling process. So what's going to happen here is it's going to do a frequency analysis of uh, the car. And it's going to do that for um, heave, pitch, and roll. And then it looks at the data, translate this all, it translates this all into its equivalent pitch, heave, and roll motions. And then what it's going to do, what we, why we clicked on the auto bump scaling, is it's just going to do a few track replays to refine the results. And this will just take a few. This will just take a few moments um, uh, to complete. Okay, so now we're doing the auto bump scaling. This is going to refine our results. And when we're done, it stops creating the bump profile. Now, what I like to do, and this is once again, rams home the point of why you put everything in the same directory. When it's done, it's created a file called bump profile.dat. And what I like to do is I'll just double click that just to make sure it hasn't done anything stupid. Now, I'll, what I'm looking for here is has it clipped out at um, its uh, bump limits that we set to minus 30 and plus 30, but it all seems to be pretty well behaved. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to rename this as bump profile, Zanvort F3, click on that. And now what we're going to do is to run our simulation, we're going to go to circuit data, curvature file, Bump profile, change the filter to star dot dat. This is our bump profile Zanvort free. Click on OK. And now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to um, set up a log for this. And I'm going to put this into my data folder. And I'm just going to save it as my initial run. I'm going to click on OK, and now I'm going to run a simulation. Okay, so we're going through, we're going to uh, do our simulation. And that is our initial, uh, that's our initial lap time. Now, one thing I was a little bit remiss about not doing is that before running a simulation, what I would highly recommend is click on Advanced Options and click on the flag Allow Apex Speed by Corner Length and set this and keep it at the default of 5%. The way that works is that when you allow this, basically what it does is it gives chassis sim a wiggle room of about 5% from the combined turn in to mid corner um, uh, turn length. So it just allows it to explore those traction limits a little bit uh, a little bit more. And this actually works really, really well. So I would strongly advise that you would use it. You don't have to use it so much if you're just going to use a flat track or a smooth circuit approximation. However, I would strongly recommend that you would set this if you are evaluating um, bumps. OK, so what we're going to do Now, one thing I would strongly recommend to do to set up in chassis sim is if you click on advanced options, click on allow apex speed by corner length and set that to about 5%. What that does is that if you click on this flag, what this does is that for 5% of the combined turn in and mid corner length, it allows chassis sim just to exceed um, uh, its force limits for that 5%. Now, 
You don't need to worry about it if you're just going to do smooth circuit approximations. You can just leave that off. However, if you're using bumps, it just gives it a little bit more. It just gives it a little bit more robustness, and that is something that's been getting significant traction in the chassis sim community. And I would strongly recommend, particularly if you're starting out, to use that flag um, to make sure that you've actually got that on. So what we're going to do is we're now now that you've, we've loaded our curvature file in, our bump profile in, we've run an initial simulation. What we're going to do is look at some data, and we're going to um, say, uh, and we're going to see how actual versus real data compare uh, com, uh, compares. So, without further ado, let's take a look. So we've got our data up. And this is our initial comparison. So what we've got here is actual data is colored, simulated data is black. So as you can see, for a first cut, we're actually in some pretty good shape here. It's not perfect, but that's okay. That's what we're going. Uh, that's um, what we're now going to work on in terms of refining. Now, a couple of key things that you need to be looking for. The biggest thing that you're looking for right now is where there are big corner displacements. Now, if you've got big corner displacements, that is screaming out for two things. It either means you need to add in altitude and road camber effects, or you need to play with the bump scale factors. Let's take a look at um, what, uh, let's take a look particularly where we've got our biggest discrepancy, which is turn five, which is a 20k an hour corner discrepancy. So typically in a situation like this, we can see that the actual dampers, which are colored, are much less than the simulated dampers, which are in the black. When you see something like this, that's usually your first port of call to start going, okay, we need to start looking at um, adding in altitude and road camber effects. Now, there are two ways that you can do this. First of all is to use a GPS circuit model. Now that's great if you've got that data. If you've got that data, plug it straight. Uh, uh, if you've got that data, plug it straight in. And the way you plug that data straight in is that you go to uh, you go to edit circuit altitude and camber. Go to edit circuit um, altitude and road camber file. We click on the import curvature file. So we uh, so we import that in, and you'll see here import circuit altitude from GPS. And we can also import road camber from GPS if you have that data available. However, if you don't have that data available, not to panic, there are a couple of key things that you can do. First things first, if the dampers are of equivalent magnitudes everywhere and your aero model is dialed in, you can go straight into using the generate circuit altitude road camber. So if, we cl uh, if uh, so we're going to um, indicate a um, uh, uh, road target that we're going to be interested in. So this is our target file. We're going to click here to import our monster file. And one thing I would strongly recommend, leave this flag off. Click here to generate elevation from damper data. You would only ever play with that if you are absolutely rock solid in your aero model, but I would leave that off um, for the time being. The other key thing is make sure you put in your sign of your lateral acceleration. So if you're positive for a left-hand turn, make sure you put in minus one and your sign of your steering. If um, your steer is positive for a right-hand turn, you put in one and obviously you put in uh, the, uh, uh, the inverse if that's the case. So to do that, we click on OK. And now what's going to happen is that we've now generated your altitude road camber file. Now, as a sanity check, what I'd like to do is I will just take a look at that file just to make sure it hasn't done anything silly. I'll just have a quick look look in here. You're making sure the numbers aren't going stupid or you don't get any minus one point, um, uh, any, uh, any weird looking stuff in there. Now, usually as, look, honestly, when you're doing, just also too for the uninitiated here, a lot of this, is just basically fire drills. You're making sure that you're not doing anything silly. So, but that actually looks pretty good. So to show you the effect of that, what we're now going to do is I'll go into circuit circuit data and I'm now going to import that altitude road camber file. I'm going to click on use altitude road camber file. And now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to say altitude road camber file, altitude road Camber, click on data file output. I'm going to go into data. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to call this Delara F3 
altitude road camber. I'm going to click on OK. I'm going to go, go to start, and now we're going to run the simulation. Now, one thing that I really sort of want to point out here about the altitude road camber generation feature, it does not replace proper road it does not to replace proper data from the road what we are doing is we are using the vehicle model and our monster file to fill in the black uh, uh, to fill in the blanks and i really cannot stress that point strongly enough so if you were to load that into your altitude road camber editor you would see some differences to what it would be in real life don't get too worried about that the reason the, the you've got those differences is that we're having to um, fill in the blanks but as you're about to see the results are actually pretty good so think of this that feature as sort of a first step to get going now what we're going to discuss once we've done the overlay, I'm going to show you a pretty neat trick that you can use using vertical acceleration as well to sort of, if you've got vertical acceleration and you've got a GPS road file, you can actually use that to come up with a very accurate picture of what your actual road cam uh, road camber is. But we'll discuss this once we've actually overlaid our um, uh, once we've overlaid our simulation. Okay, so we're just about done. And now here is our altitude road camber file. So what we're going to do now is we're going to, uh, what we're now going to do is we're now going to add that in. And we'll compare this to our actual data. So as you can see, that's gone a long way to fixing our problem in turn five. So now where we had a 20k an hour difference, we now have a 10k an hour difference. And you can also see the fact that the dampers are now pretty close. At this stage of the game, one of the things I would be tempted to, e, uh, tempted to do is you'd almost tidy that up with uh, grip factor. So that would probably be at one point in the game. But just having a look at an overall view, it's actually, you know, at this point in the game, I would uh, be inclined to run, uh, at this point in the game, I would be inclined to go into circuit, auto grip determination, add your monster import file, specify a grip factor file, run the auto grip matching and click on OK. Now. I might do that at the end, but I'm not going to do that right now because one other effect I want to show you about what to look for is when to play with bump scale factors. Now, a really, really big giveaway that you need to deal with bump scale factors is when you get a really, really big discrepancy. Now, particularly if you've got something like you had in turn five, except this time it is much, much more pronounced. You'll see a very distinctive V in the simulator trace. The braking will be okay, but all of a sudden the cornering speeds will go away. When you have a situation like this, that's when you play with bump scale factors. And don't be too surprised if you've got to sort of underestimate the bumps a little bit to get the cornering speeds um, uh, uh, to, pl uh, to get the cornering speeds um, uh, to play up. As your tire model gets better, and as your experience with chassis sim gets better, your need to do that will start to fall away a little bit. However, what I'm going to do right now is give you a cause and effect about how to do bump scale factoring. Now, typically what I like to do with bump scale factoring is the, the regions that you need to pay attention to, and I'm just going to add um, the curvature channel here just to illustrate. When you're tuning your bump scale factors, you really want to be tuning your bump scale factors from the turn in to the end of the mid corner section. So for, for instance, here we've got a, a distance from 16 to 1800 meters. So the way that we're going to edit that in chassis sim is that we're going to go to circuit, edit variable grip factors. Now we've got two options. We can either import the curvature and the bump profile uh, manually or we import the circuit files from circuit data. So if you've already got your curvature and your bump profile loaded, you can put all this in and away you go. So what we're going to do is just as a simple cause and effect, I am going to navigate by using the uh, right arrow key. I'm going to go to the 1600 uh, meter um, uh, I'm going to go to the 1600 um, uh, meter section and I'm going to highlight that to the 1800 meter section. And now what I do is press the tab key and now 
what I'm just going to do is I'm just going to go, I'm going to halve the bumps. Again, this is more for cause and effect. And when I'm done, I'm going to generate my variable grip factors. So I'll call my grip, for, I'll, um, and you've got to do this for both. So I'll call grip factor sand vort f free, and I'm going to go bump scale factor. And I'm going to, uh, you, can, you can use this as either a text file or a dat file. I just like to use it as a dat file because I'm just a grumpy, uh, just because I'm pretty set in my ways. But we, um, choo uh, uh, we choose that, we click on OK, and we are done. So what I'm now going to do is I'm going to go into circuit data. I'm going to import my bump scale factor file. And I'm going to use bump scale factors. Now, just for cause and effect, I'm turning off my altitude camber off for the, for the time being because I want to show you that effect of what it's doing in turn five. So I'm going to click on OK. I'm now going to um, log this. And I'm just going to call this bump scale factor test. And I am just going to call this Bump scale factor test, click on OK, and now we're going to run the simulation again. The simulation, and now let's overlay the data. And we'll compare this. Here's our actual data. We'll compare this to what we just did. Now, as we can see, see the effect this, is, uh, this has had before, we were talking a discrepancy, uh, 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 we were, talking a, uh, we were uh, talking a discrepancy of nearly 20K an hour. By halving out the bumps, we've dropped that down to about 10K. So really, if you've got a really, really big discrepancy, like it, the corner of speeds is just dropping away, that is your cue to use bump scale factor. And I really want to ram that point home very strongly. So just to sort of finish off the point that I was making earlier about editing, um, about some tips and tricks that you can do with um, your altitude road camber file, you'll see here that uh, if, uh, you've got GPS data from the actual car and you basically want a plot of, um, dist of um, circuit length in meters versus altitude in meters and You've got a monster file with your AZ, uh, with your AZM. You can, uh, you can um, uh, go, uh, you can use that to go for. Uh, you can use that to actually manufacture what uh, 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 to actually get a really good guess, of, uh, a really good guess of what the road camber is actually um, uh, looking like. So that's a really good. Uh, uh, that's actually a really really good fe feature to use. So to sum up, the circuit creation process in chassis sim is that what we do is that we go to our create filter curvature file, we import our monster file, create a curvature file. We then go into bump profile modeling and go through, import our monster file, run our auto bump scaling uh, factors, make sure that we've got, our, uh, uh, we've got our appropriate settings, generate the bump profile. When we've done that, what we then do is depending on the data logging software you've got, we then overlay our initial run, and we see what we need to uh, uh, what we need to look at. Now, if we've got a pretty well sorted arrow model, we can go. Uh, if we've got a pretty well sorted arrow model, and we're getting corner discrepancies that looks like this with really big changes in terms of what our simulated versus actual dampers are uh, doing. That's your cue to uh, to use the auto altitude road camber feature, or to get your um, or to get your GPS data. However, if you are still getting really big discrepancies in your speed, that is when you go back into chassis sim and play with bump scale factors. And to do that, we just basically import the circuit files from the circuit data, go to um, the various distance of interest, hit the shift key to highlight a section, hit the tab key, and then we, uh, then we put in what our relevant numbers should be. Now, to kick off with, I would probably suggest bump scale factors of about 0.7 or so. However, as you get more used to this, then it will um, become, uh, uh, then it's going to become second nature. But then, but that's pretty much all there is to creating a circuit map in chassis sim. So 
create your curvature file, create your bump profile, look at the correlation, see where the discrepancies are. If you're getting big differences in overall damper movement, that's your cue to do altitude road camber. If you don't have those big discrepancies in damper movement and you're getting big discrepancies of, of speed, that's your cue to play with bump scale. Uh, that's your cue to play with bump scale factors. And also too, for chassis sim novices, one thing I would strongly recommend, click on the advanced options tabs, click on allow apex speed by corner length. But everything we've just discussed is pretty much will get you to about 95, 90, it will get you to 90, 95% of creating a really, really good circuit model. The other thing that I would recommend if you go into the chassis sim help directory and you go into help, you will find a document called chassis sim track creation. I would strongly recommend, just give it a moment or two to open up, I would strongly recommend read that document because it just crystallizes everything we've talked about. Uh, it crystallizes everything that we've talked about here. So this sums it up for uh, this latest chassis sim video tutorial. I hope you got something out of it, and we will catch you in the next episode of uh, the next episode of Dan's Vehicle Dynamics Corner or the later or the next chassis sim video tutorial.